On a rainy afternoon, as mourners gathered around a coffin to say their final goodbyes, a sudden lightning bolt struck the casket. Instantly, what was meant to be a somber funeral became something no one could have predicted. As the sun began to set, casting long shadows across the village, Carol's body was carefully prepared for burial. The local mortician had been instructed to forego embalming due to the family's request for a quick burial. Not long after, dark clouds started gathering overhead as they carried the casket to the burial ground. The air felt heavy with an approaching storm, matching the somber mood of the mourners. Lightning flashed in the distance, the storm growing more intense with each passing moment. Suddenly, without warning, a powerful lightning bolt split the sky, striking the metal-trimmed coffin with a loud crack. The mourners at the funeral scattered in panic, some screaming, others frozen in shock. Carol's grandmother, Gina, looked on in shock. Her poor girl had been through enough in life. Now, even in death, she couldn't go easily. Gina's mind took her back to all that Carol had been through. Carol had always felt like an outsider. Her parents' messy divorce when she was just eight years old had left deep emotional scars. Neither parent wanted the responsibility of raising a child alone, so Carol's mother unceremoniously sent her to live with her grandmother in the small village of Millbrook. It was as if Carol's mother had simply vanished, never calling or visiting, leaving the young girl to grapple with feelings of abandonment and unworthiness. Growing up in Millbrook, Carol struggled to fit in. Her plain clothes, remnants of a life unloved by her parents, made her an easy target for bullies at school. Only her grandmother Gina's unwavering love provided stability in Carol's tumultuous young life. As she grew old and moved to the city after college, hoping for a fresh start, Carol still felt like that awkward girl abandoned by her parent. Working as a librarian at the Central Public Library, she lived a quiet, solitary life in a small apartment filled with books and cats. Then, one Friday night, Carol's co-worker, Jenny, had finally convinced her to go out. You can't spend every weekend with your nose in a book, Jenny insisted. Come on, live a little. Reluctantly, Carol allowed herself to be dragged to the Red Door, a popular nightclub downtown. The pulsing music and flashing lights made her head spin as Jenny pulled her towards the bar. Two martinis, please, Jenny shouted to the bartender over the din. As Carol sipped her drink, trying not to grimace at the unfamiliar burn of alcohol, she felt someone bump into her. She turned, ready to apologize, and found herself face to face with the most gorgeous man she'd ever seen. Sorry about that, he said with a mischievous grin. Can I buy you a drink to make up for it? His name was Franklin, and he was everything Carol wasn't. With his leather jacket, perfectly tousled hair, and devil-may-care attitude, he exuded confidence and charm. For the first time in her life, Carol felt wanted and beautiful. They started talking that night, finding common ground in their love for old movies and spicy food. Franklin's easy laugh and attentive gaze made Carol feel seen in a way she never had before. They exchanged numbers, and soon, daily texts turned into long phone calls that stretched late into the night. Coffee dates became dinner dates, and they saw each other daily before Carol knew it. She opened up, sharing hopes and dreams she'd never dared voice aloud. Their whirlwind romance swept her off her feet. Franklin introduced her to a world she'd only read about in books, one of excitement, passion, and adventure. You're not like other girls, Maggie he'd say, twirling a strand of her hair around his finger. You're special. But one night, reality came crashing down. Carol had been trying to reach Franklin all day, but he had not returned her calls or texts. Worried, she decided to surprise him at his favorite hangout. As she pushed open the heavy wooden door, the familiar smell of stale beer and cigarette smoke hit her. And there was Franklin at the bar. But he wasn't alone. His arm was draped around a leggy blonde, his lips pressed against her ear as he whispered something that made her giggle. Franklin? Carol's voice came out as a choked whisper. He looked up, annoyance flashing across his face before being replaced by a sneer. Well, well, look who it is. Stalking me now, Maggie? I... I was worried about you, Carol stammered, feeling small under the curious stares of the other patrons. You weren't answering your phone. Franklin laughed a harsh sound that cut through the bar's dim atmosphere. When was the last time you looked in a mirror, huh? You dressed like a grandma playing dress-up and you're clingy as hell. Playing the nice guy was fun, but I'm bored now. Just disappear, will you? Humiliated and heartbroken, she fled into the night, unaware of where she was going. Tears streamed down her face, blurring her vision as she stumbled into a dimly lit alley. Collapsing against a brick wall, Carol sobbed uncontrollably. Was this truly her destiny? To be alone forever? Unlovable and unwanted? Months passed, and Carol tried to move on. 
She threw herself into her work at the library, finding solace in the familiar smell of old books and the quiet rustle of turning pages. But the wound Franklin left still festered, a constant reminder of her inadequacy. Then, one day, Carol sat in her favorite cafe, watching raindrops race down the window. She sipped her coffee when her phone buzzed with a text from Jenny. OMG, did you hear? Franklin's getting married this weekend. To that girl from the bar. The words blurred as fresh tears welled up. Carol's shoulders shook with silent sobs, oblivious to the concerned glances from nearby patrons. She didn't notice the tall, dark-haired man approach her table until he spoke. Excuse me, miss? Is everything all right? Carol looked up, startled. The stranger's kind eyes and gentle smile caught her off guard. I'm... I'm fine, she stammered, hastily wiping her eyes. Just having a bad day, that's all. The man's brow furrowed with concern. I'm Kane, he said, offering a handkerchief. I couldn't help but notice you seem upset. Sometimes talking to a stranger can help. May I sit? Against her better judgment, Carol nodded. There was something disarming about Kane's calm demeanor. Before she knew it, she found herself pouring out her story. Her lonely childhood. Her disastrous relationship with Franklin and her fears of never finding true love. Kane listened intently. When Carol finished, he leaned forward, his eyes serious. You know, Carol, the problem isn't that you're unlovable. It's that you don't love yourself enough. His words struck a chord deep within her. Over the next few weeks, Kane became Carol's unexpected mentor and friend. He encouraged her to try new things and to step out of her comfort zone. Slowly but surely, Carol began to see herself in a new light. She started taking better care of herself and speaking up more at work, offering ideas in meetings instead of staying silent. With Kane's support, she discovered a newfound confidence and self-worth. As Carol's self-confidence grew, so did her feelings for Kane. His kindness and unwavering support had awakened something she thought long dead in her. When Kane finally confessed his growing affection, Carol felt like she was living in a dream. I've never met anyone like you, Carol, Kane said one evening as they walked hand in hand through the park. You're kind, intelligent, and stronger than you know. I think, I think I'm falling in love with you. Their relationship blossomed, built on mutual respect and genuine care. For the first time, Carol felt truly loved and accepted for who she was. She and Kane discussed building a future together, marriage, and starting a family. Then one day, Kane surprised Carol with a picnic in the countryside. They spent the day hiking, laughing, and enjoying each other's company. As the sun began to set, painting the sky in brilliant shades of orange and pink, they reluctantly packed up to head home. This has been the perfect day, Carol said, touching Kane's shoulder as he drove. Kane smiled momentarily taking his eyes off the road to look at her. We have all the time in the world, my love. Neither of them saw the deer until it was too late. The animal came out of the woods, freezing in the middle of the road. Kane swerved to avoid it, the car skidding on loose gravel. Time seemed to slow as the vehicle rolled, metal crunching and glass shattering. When silence finally fell, Carol's world shattered along with it. Paramedics arrived quickly, but it was too late. Kane was pronounced dead at the scene. Carol survived but with severe injuries. The accident had damaged her heart, requiring surgery to implant a defibrillator. As she recovered in the hospital, grief consumed her. Unable to face staying in the city alone after leaving the hospital, Carol returned to her grandmother's house. Gina's familiar refrain, everything happens for a reason, now felt like a hollow platitude. What possible reason could there be for such tragedy? Carol went through the motions of living, but inside, she felt numb. Her only solace was long walks in the woods near her grandmother's home. During one of her solitary walks in the village square, Carol met Emily, a cheerful young woman who had recently returned from the city. Emily's designer clothes and carefree attitude stood out in the village. You look like you could use a friend, Emily said, approaching Carol with a dazzling smile. I'm Emily. I just moved back to take care of my dad. Want to grab a coffee? Carol hesitated, but she had no one else except her grandmother so she thought making a friend in the village shouldn't hurt. They shared their stories over steaming cups of coffee at the local diner. Emily listened with sympathy as Carol poured out her grief over Kane's death. I know exactly what you need, Emily said, reaching across the table to squeeze Carol's hand. Something to take the edge off, help you relax. I've got just the thing. That night, in the back of Emily's car, Carol tried her first pill. The effect was immediate and intense. For the first time since Kane's death, the constant ache in her chest subsided, replaced by a floating sensation of warmth and peace. See, Emily said, her smile seeming to glow in the darkness. 
Sometimes you need some help to get through the tough times. In the back of her mind, Carol knew that what she was doing was dangerous, but the relief was too powerful to resist. She began looking forward to her secret meetings with Emily, always carefully hiding her new habit from her grandmother. Gina noticed a change in her granddaughter's behavior and attributed it to Carol finally coming to terms with her grief. You seem more at peace, she remarked one evening over the dinner. I'm glad you're making friends with that nice Emily girl. If only she knew the truth. As weeks passed, Carol needed more and more of Emily's little helpers to achieve the same effect. She started to lose weight. Her sleep became erratic, and her moods swung wildly between artificial euphoria and crushing despair. One morning, Carol forced herself out for her usual walk in the woods. Her movements were jerky after a night of taking too many pills. Gina saw the change in her granddaughter, hollow eyes, shaking hands in pockets, an unnatural energy about her. Worried, she insisted on joining the walk despite Carol's objections. The fresh air will do us both good, Gina said, patting Carol's trembling hand as they walked along the leaf-strewn path. They had just reached a small clearing when tragedy struck. Her vision was blurry, and her balance was off. Carol tripped over an exposed root. She stumbled forward, her foot catching on a fallen branch, and fell hard to the floor. Carol! Gina cried out, rushing to her granddaughter's side. Are you all right, sweetheart? But Carol didn't respond. With shaking hands, Gina called emergency services on her old phone. Please hurry, she cried. My granddaughter's in trouble. We're in the woods on Oakley Trail. Help arrived almost immediately. Two volunteers from the village's fire department, doubling as emergency responders, came crashing through the underbrush with a stretcher. Over here, Gina called out, her voice hoarse from crying. The responders, who had known Carol since she was a little girl, worked quickly to assess the situation. We need to get her to Dr. Dustin right away, the responders said grimly as they lifted Carol onto the stretcher into the back of the car. By the time they burst through the clinic's doors, Dr. Dustin was waiting, having been alerted by the emergency call. Put her in exam room one. The doctor worked tirelessly, using every resource at his disposal. As Carol's local physician, he had been helping her manage her heart condition since she moved back to the countryside. He was familiar with her case history, the car accident in the city, the defibrillator implanted by specialists there, and the careful monitoring required. Despite his best efforts to help her adjust to life with the device, it failed when she needed it most. As their eyes met, Gina knew. Before Dr. Dustin could speak, she let out a heart-wrenching sob. The doctor's solemn head shake confirmed her worst fears. Carol, her beloved granddaughter, had passed away. Gina collapsed into a nearby chair, her body shaking with uncontrollable sobs. Dr. Dustin knelt beside her, trying to comfort her. Gina's grief echoed through the small clinic, drawing the attention of the staff and other patients. Soon, word spread through the tight-knit community that Carol had died. The tragic news presented an immediate challenge for the village. Millbrook, with its population of just over 500, lacked many modern amenities, including a proper morgue. The small clinic, already stretched thin with limited resources, had no facilities for storing bodies for extended periods. The community rallied together, as they always did in times of crisis, and quickly arranged for a coffin. The funeral had been taking place when the sudden lightning hit the coffin. Then something incredible happens. As the initial chaos subsided, a faint sound and movement emerged from the coffin, a muffled groan barely perceptible amidst the storm's fury. Dr. Dustin, who was in the crowd to pay his last respects, pushed through the crowd to get to the coffin, his face pale with disbelief. He ran his finger across Carol's neck. I... I feel a pulse, he stammered. It's weak, but it's there. We need to get her to the hospital immediately, Dr. Dustin ordered, his voice cutting him through the panicked murmurs of the crowd. And someone calls the Central City Hospital. Tell them we have an emergency coming their way. As they lifted Carol from the coffin and carried her to Dr. Dustin's waiting car, the doctor turned to Gina. I don't know how this is possible, he said, his voice tight with urgency. But Carol needs more advanced care than I can provide here. I'm taking her to Central City Hospital myself. The drive to the hospital was tense, with Dr. Dustin constantly checking Carol's vital signs. He had administered first aid to stabilize her condition, but he knew she needed specialized care and fast. Hang in there, Carol, he muttered, pressing down on the accelerator. Just a little longer. The doctor's mind whirled with possibilities as they sped down the winding country roads. How had he missed this? He still can't process it. Thirty agonizing minutes later, they screeched to a halt outside Central City Hospital's emergency entrance. A team of doctors and nurses, alerted by Millbrook's frantic call, was waiting with a gurney. As they rushed Carol inside, Dr. Dustin quickly briefed the emergency team. 
26-year-old female, previously declared deceased, revived by a lightning strike. History of cardiac issues. As Carol disappeared behind the swinging doors of the trauma unit, Dr. Dustin turned to Gina, who had followed in another car. I'm so sorry, he began. But Gina quickly hugged him. You brought her back to us, she said, her voice thick with emotion. That's all that matters now. Inside the emergency room, a team of specialists worked tirelessly to unravel the mystery of Carol's condition. As they delved deeper, they made an astounding discovery. The lightning strike hadn't just been a freak accident, but saved Carol's life. The powerful surge had activated her implanted defibrillator, jumpstarting her heart and jolting her entire system back into action. The tests also revealed what the clinic, with its limited resources, had missed. Carol's system was flooded with a dangerous combination of drugs, slowing her heart rate and respiratory function to levels that mimicked death. Without specialized equipment, detecting the faint signs of life would have been nearly impossible. It's a perfect storm, the lead doctor explained to a shell-shocked Gina hours later. The drug suppressed her system to a point that mimicked death. The lightning strike didn't just activate her defibrillator, it essentially shocked her entire system. But with proper care, she has a good chance at recovery. As Carol lay in the ICU, machines beeping steadily around her, Gina held her granddaughter's hand. Her face was etched with worry but her eyes never left Carol's face. Day and night, Gina remained by her side, whispering words of encouragement and love. Slowly but surely, Carol began to show signs of improvement. Her vital signs stabilized, and after three weeks, she finally opened her eyes. She first saw her grandmother's tear-stained face smiling down at her. Welcome back, my dear, Gina said, her voice choked with emotion. Over the next three months, Carol underwent intensive physical therapy and counseling. The road to recovery was long and difficult, but Gina was there every step of the way, offering unwavering support and love. As Carol regained her strength, she also grappled with the weight of her actions. One evening, as she and Gina sat in the hospital garden, Carol turned to her grandmother with tears in her eyes. I'm so sorry, Grandma, she whispered, for everything, for the drugs, for putting you through all this worry. I was just so lost after Cain died. I didn't know how to cope. Gina pulled her granddaughter into a tight embrace. Oh, my dear girl, she said, we all make mistakes. What matters is that you're here now and fighting to get better. I'm so proud of you. After being discharged, the small village rallied around them, offering support and kindness. Slowly, Carol began to rebuild her life, finding strength in the simple routines of village life and the unconditional love of her grandmother. Four months after her discharge, Carol returned to the city hospital for a routine checkup. A young man sat beside her in the waiting room, nervously fidgeting with her purse strap. First time here? He asked with a kind smile. Carol shook her head. No, just a checkup, but I still get nervous. The man nodded understandingly. I'm Isaac, he said, offering his hand. I work in the pediatric ward. Want to hear some stories to take your mind off the wait? Over the next 30 minutes, Isaac shared stories of his work in the pediatric ward, a mix of funny, touching, and inspiring tales. When Carol's name was called, she found herself reluctant to leave. Captivated by Isaac's warmth and compassion, Isaac expressed interest in hearing Carol's story as she stood to go, suggesting they meet again soon. In the weeks that followed, Carol and Isaac's connection deepened. Their shared experiences and mutual understanding helped heal Carol's past wounds, and she fell deeply in love. A year later, they exchanged vows in a small ceremony in Millbrook. Gina beamed with pride as she watched her granddaughter, radiant, in a simple white dress, begin this new chapter of her life. Carol's journey from tragedy to healing shows how strong people can be. Her story proves that even in the darkest times, there's hope. She went from addiction and despair to finding new love and becoming a mother. Through it all, her grandmother's love helped save her. What do you think about Carol's extraordinary journey? Share your thoughts and experiences in the comments below. And thank you for listening to this powerful tale. Join us for more exciting stories like this.